Um, we're so thrilled that you're here. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this special joint programming of the Advancement Project, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, the National Urban League, Race Forward and Stop Repeating History. I am Mary Smith, the Vice President and Managing Director of Programs at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. I will be the moderator today and I am joined by simply a superstar panel. Judith Brown Dianis, the Executive Director of the Advancement Project, Glenn Harris, President, Race Forward, Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, John Osaka, who you've already heard from, the filmmaker of the wonderful film that we just saw, Reparations, and Don Tamaki, he's a member of the California Reparations Task Force. We hope everyone has had the chance to watch the film Reparations, which was screened immediately preceding this panel. The film is a powerful story of the history of our country on racial issues and injustices, which unfortunately continue to this day. It also underscores the need for allyship. This documentary is, examines reparations from two different but connected perspectives, specifically reparations for the Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II, the role in which the black community helped in achieving reparations for Japanese Americans, and the need to address reparations for the black community right now. The documentary is produced by the Korematsu Quorum Nobis legal team that successfully challenged the constitutionality of the Japanese American incarceration. Today, we convene this panel to honor Juneteenth, which commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. It is commemorated on the anniversary date of June 19, 1865, um, when finally news of uh, the order of ending slavery reached Texas. President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had officially outlawed slavery in Texas and the other states in rebellion against the Union almost two and a half years earlier. Enforcement of the proclamation generally relied on the advance of Union troops. Texas, as the most remote of the slave states, had a low presence of Union troops as the Civil War ended. Thus, enforcement there had been in slow and inconsistent before the announcement. So that is why we're here today. And I will introduce the panelists uh, right before I call in them to speak. Um, so now it is my honor to introduce Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, the nation's largest civil rights and urban advocacy organization. He was mayor of New Orleans from 1994 to 2002, and during that time, he led New Orleans Renaissance and left office with an unprecedented 70% approval rating. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in economics and African American studies, he also holds a law degree from Georgetown University. So, Mark, uh, I'm gonna. We're, we've been hearing more about Juneteenth in recent years. And why is it important to commemorate Juneteenth? Why has it been gaining more visibility? In fact, today, just uh, today, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot in Chicago announced that starting next year, Juneteenth will be a legal holiday in Chicago. And I think there's an announcement expected from the governor of Illinois as well. So why is it particularly important at this particular time of racial reckoning? Mark, you're on um, mute. Yeah, let me thank you for having me. I'm, I'm proud and honored to be on this panel. I wanna certainly uh, give my, uh, uh, my best wishes to all of the co-members of the panel for all of their hard work over the years. I, Juneteenth uh, should be understood as the day when slavery officially ended in the Confederate States of America, the states that had been in rebellion to the United States. And I think it's important to understand what Juneteenth represented. We understand, as everyone does, that the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1, 1863, but only applied to those states who were in rebellion 
to the United States of America, which means that slavery in places like New Jersey and New York and other places where uh, there were people who owned slaves was not affected uh, by uh, that Emancipation Proclamation. But as, 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 as the injustice of the times, it was two and a half years until the enslaved people of Texas found out when General Gordon Granger read aloud uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and the military order which effectuated it. And so Juneteenth creates, I think for us, this opportunity for people to understand uh, the, hor the horrific nature of slavery uh, and the efforts to end it in the United States. And I hope people will understand that while Juneteenth is so crucial and important to recognize and to celebrate, it required the 13th, the 14th and the 15th amendment uh, really the 13th Amendment to truly outlaw slavery because the Emancipation Proclamation was an order carried out by Lincoln under his war powers. Uh, and he rightfully understood that uh, without an amendment to the Constitution after the war ended, it would not, uh, as a matter of course, end slavery automatically. So I look at Juneteenth as this opportunity for us to educate and re-educate people about slavery and the effort to undo it, but also also uh, an opportunity to demonstrate the, if you will, granddaughters and grandsons of the slave system in the United States, which is institutional racism. And, uh, and if you will, structural exclusion, which exists today and why we have to work to fight the battle. The Juneteenth, uh, the 13th and 14th Amendment did not do what they were intended to do because they were undercut uh, by Southerners. They were, it was undercut by political deals like, such as the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, undercut by the Supreme Court in 1883 and in 1896. Uh, and so there was massive resistance to, uh, to the end of slavery. And while the South lost the war, they won some subsequent political battles, which allowed the creation of, uh, if you will, a new form of slavery, that being segregation. And it legalized it and it sought to normalize it. Uh, and we are dealing with the impact and the effect of that today. So it's important to recognize the, if you will, end of slavery, which I think is what Juneteenth represents in people's minds. But it's important as well, I think, to see it as a chance for us to better educate uh, the American people, better educate a contemporary population about slavery. Too many Americans uh, and school children do not even recognize today that the Civil War was fought over slavery. Uh, they do not understand that it was, uh, it, it was necessary for the Constitution to be amended three times. That is as important as understanding about the Declaration of Independence. That is as important as understanding who the Founding Fathers were, to understand this battle, this work, this effort to overcome slavery and its after effects in this country. Oh, thank you. That is so um, important that Juneteenth uh, allows us to learn about history, but also hopefully demonstrates to us that there's still a lot of work to be done today. So now I would like to introduce Glenn Harris. He's president of uh, the New Race Forward and publisher of Color Lines. The New Race Forward is the union of two leading racial justice nonprofit organizations, Race Forward and Center for Social Inclusion where Glenn served as president starting in 2014. The New Race Forward builds on the work of both organizations to advance racial justice. He brings over 25 years of experience working on race and social justice, including with community groups, foundations, and government agencies. So Glenn, June is also the month that marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, as well as June both Juneteenth, both events which we have not heard much about until recent years. What do you see about the current environment 
in advancing racial equity that makes it different from prior periods? Thank you so much, Mary. Um, it's such, a, uh, such an important question, but I have to uh, start out by just saying thank you to John uh, for making such a powerful film um, that's both centered on reparations, but also this idea of radical solidarity. Um, it's a conversation we need to have more of um, nationally. So thank you, really. Um, and of course, mad love to all of our panelists. Um, always a, a, a genuine pleasure. And I love, Mark, what you named about um, Juneteenth. Um, it's a chance, I hope you all think about what it means to celebrate the idea of freedom in my mind at its core. And in thinking about all these markers we're naming, um, as we think about the 100 year mark for the Tulsa massacre, um, the truth is, is that that's just the, there's only one story. Maybe that's really what I want to name. It's, it's a straight through line about who we are as a country that's rooted in Native American genocide and the enslavement of Black people. And that debate, that struggle, as Mark was naming it, it's just one story through. And the Tulsa massacre represents sort of the brutality of white supremacist response on full display. Um, it was to enshrine, right, um, the ideas of segregation. Um, the, the very idea of white supremacy. Um, and it was in fact a, uh, a continued part of the backlash that came in the wake of the first reconstruction, Juneteenth, right? Um, the end of slavery. Um, the first time that black people led uh, to us collectively towards meeting our ideals of justice and democracy. Um, and not the first time, but the most first time in recent history in which the pushback was violent and brutal. And then we jump to the second reconstruction of civil rights. Um, and, you know, Vincent Harding, um, civil rights activist, uh, someone I deeply admire said, you know, all of this is a simple question. Is America possible? Is a just multiracial democratic society possible? Civil rights movement again, actually engages in a fight that really is rooted in centering sort of policy and citizenship by law, right? Um, and in the wake of it, we see this massive pushback um, that, you know, we've seen continue all the way through into this century. But I deeply believe to answer your question about what's different about this moment, I believe we are in the third reconstruction. Um, I believe the movement for black lives and the uprisings we saw last year in which we had over 25 million people take to the streets represent a moment that's not just about entering, entering into another reconstruction, but a fundamentally different one. That is, um, as the film points out, really truly rooted in this idea of systemic racism. Not just asking for policy change, but actually asking for us to reimagine the very systems that we're in, like public safety. Um, I also think that in that way, it's not just policy, it's all also in that way reimagining our institutions, but it's also fundamentally a narrative shift about how we talk about who we are collectively. And in this moment, we see massive pushback. Um, even as we've seen 25 million people take to the streets, to be clear, last year in print media, uh, the term systemic racism was used more often than the last 30 years combined. And that shift, that shift in what the national debate can be and should be has resulted in this massive pushback. And we see it in real ways. It is everything about the attack on voter rights for black and brown people we see, but also this very specific attack that was actually started by the Trump administration rooted in an attack on critical race theory and the very idea that we should ban words like systemic racism. Um, this very idea that if you can't win the argument, shut the argument down. And so in that way, we have over a dozen states right now in battles, whether it's in schools or in government about whether they can even use terms that would allow us to have this conversation. And that's why I believe so uh, fundamentally that we, the conversation on reparations is more necessary than ever. Um, as James Baldwin named, 
not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this is our moment. It's our opportunity to face our history and our current reality and make repair. No, thank you. And, and that is so true, Glenn, about you can't solve something unless you can talk about it or have your voice heard. And so next, I would like to introduce Judith Brown Deannis. Uh, she's the head of the Advancement Project and since joining the Advancement Project at its inception, she has worked with grassroots organizations to wage successful campaigns using litigation, advocacy, and communications. She has authored groundbreaking educational reports uh, including opportunities suspended and derailed the schoolhouse to jailhouse track. And she also in the advancement project are doing incredible work. Uh, uh, Judith actually started the advancement projects voter protection program uh, during the election uh, debacle in Florida in 2000. We all remember that. But unfortunately, we're seeing just a spate of, um, uh, of these voting uh, bills circulating now and passing. So I wanted to ask you, Judith, uh, how does the commemoration of Juneteenth double tail with this issue of voting rights and the efforts to um, impede voting rights that we're seeing in so many state legislatures today? And how does that this collaboration that we're having today play into the work of the Advancement Project? Sure, thank you, Mary. And, um, and I want to thank you, John, for the film, um, really important. And I think to pick up on what Glenn said about the, the radical solidarity is what we need in this moment. Um, you know, one of the things that stood out to me about the film was um, when one of the people talked about the fact that when um, black people have fought for things and won, we've all benefited from it, right? And so that acknowledgement um, and knowing that we're in this journey together, right? Um, to as Glenn says and, and Dr. Vincent Harding says, you know, I am a citizen of a country that does not yet exist. And so um, that is what we are doing. And so Juneteenth really is about this journey towards freedom. Um, and when we think about the fact that Juneteenth came two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, it's kind of similar to what the Supreme Court said in Brown v. Board, that we would get past school, school segregation with all deliberate speed. And unfortunately, that's what our country has done with the freedom of Black people, is that we have been on a journey towards freedom with so-called all deliberate speed. Because we were freed in 1863, kind of, sort of, <laughs> then kind of, sort of, in 1865. And as some of us say, we're kind of freeish. Um, but it wasn't until 1870 that we saw the 15th Amendment ratified, uh, which was supposed to uh, stop and prohibit discrimination in voting. Um, but again, with all deliberate speed, or not so much, <laughs> we get until not until 1965 that we see the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And it took a lot of blood, took a lot of sweat and tears and beatings of our people to see that. And that we stood in solidarity. It was not just black people, but we had other Americans standing with us to say that we cannot be free until we have the franchise. And so now we are still in this fight um, because America still hasn't seen uh, what we would say is a full democracy or even a full republic for that matter, that we still are living with the idea that we shouldn't all vote, right? We were three fifths of a person and now we might be a whole person, but it, they don't want to recognize that in the voting booth. And so what we have seen over these years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act is a continuation of making it difficult for Black people and other people of color to participate in our democracy. Because we know that when we actually do allow people to participate in our democracy, when we make it easier for them to vote, that they actually will participate, that they will gain power, and that when we gain power and when we have this inclusive democracy that we all really want, at least those of us who are probably here today want, 
that in fact, we will see a shift of many things, including the end of structural racism. And we will be leaning into the principles of freedom for all. And so we've seen a state of voter suppression laws that have um, that are passing at the state level, um, places like Texas and Georgia, you know, and Georgia and Florida Advancement Project um, has brought lawsuits on behalf of Black and Brown voters. Um, this is the fight that we are in because we have white supremacy on the one hand that understands the power that it has had since the founding of this country. And there are those who don't want to give up that power. And those of us who are saying there's a new majority coming and um, that we are going to fight for our ability to exercise the franchise and to have voice. And so this is a moment where this coalition and, you know, it is an all hands on deck moment for us to save our democracy. Um, for us to decide that we are all going to have a voice, for us to lean into passing the For the People, uh, We the People Act, For the People Act, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, because we know that if we cannot put in laws that protect us all and protect the franchise, that we will continue to see structural racism and that Juneteenth will continue to be undermined. And so this is our opportunity to continue to work together towards a inclusive democracy that works for all of us to fight against all these laws that, that actually make it harder for us to vote, harder for us to register, harder for us to elect people who will build the inclusive democracy that we want to see. Thank you. Well, thanks, Judith. And, and I agree. It's a certainly is an all hands on deck moment. And so I want to transition to John, who you've already heard from, who uh, made this amazing film that kind of started this dialogue for us today. And John is an award-winning filmmaker who has directed and produced promotional, educational, narrative, and documentary films. His initial interest in film grew out of his desire to share the stories of the Japanese Community Youth Council, where he has served as executive director since 1996. Um, John, tell us about the film, how you got involved, and what you want people to take away after watching the film. Well, so I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, my father. Um, he was, who was incarcerated for four years during World War II because of his race. Uh, and when President Carter established the Commission on Wartime Relocation and, and Internment of Civilians, which is very similar to the commission being proposed by HR 40, um, he attended uh, one of those public hearings. And as he sat there listening to the testimony, um, tears started flowing down his face and he began to openly weep. And he shared this, this story that, you know, um, after decades of suppressing this trauma, this grief that he had experienced, um, that this, the dialogue from the commissions um, was the first time that it was allowed to come out. And it started his journey to at least partially healing from his experience during World War II. And that's what I took away from this project is that you know, HR 40 and reparations for the black community is really about healing this country um, and wounds that have been allowed to stay open for just far too long. And I think as Americans, um, it, you know, we should want to work towards a more perfect union. Um, and that this is really what this movement is about. And for you know, the Asian American community, um, we've in the past year had very painful reminders of how systemic racism continues and will continue to impact our communities. And so, and I think it is, that is why it is so important that we identify ways where we can work together to address this. Because it's only together that we're going to be able to make the most progress. And, and the one thing that um, I don't want to take too much time, but the one thing I, I do want to acknowledge is that the forces that have been in place and actively trying to divide our communities have been far too successful. And that it is so important 
that our communities um, understand that, right? That every time we engage in narratives that divide us, we're enabling and perpetuating systemic racism in this country. And that we, and I love the term radical solidarity because I think that needs to become the narrative between our communities more so than the division. And I'm hopeful that you know, collectively we can start to work towards that because I believe that is the only way, right? We are going to make this country better for all of us. And so that's something that I hope um, this film can lead to more dialogue about that, more, more understanding and, and identifying that, you know, there are, I believe that this is an important opportunity, right? For us to stand up um, for the black community and their efforts for reparations and that that will benefit everybody. So that's what I hope that folks will take away from this film. Thanks, John, so much for your powerful film and, and um, helping us to elevate the concept of radical solidarity. So last, I wanna to turn to Don Tamaki. He's senior counsel at Minami Tamaki. He served on the legal team that reopened Korematsu, uh, which overturned Fred Korematsu's conviction for refusing incarceration. He is also co-founder of Stop Repeating History, a, a co-sponsor uh, of this event today, a campaign focused on drawing parallels between the incarceration of Japanese Americans and the targeting of groups today based on race or religion. He's a past executive director of the Asian Law Caucus Advancing Justice. Um, and most recently, he was named by California Governor Gavin Newsom to the new task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. So Don, I'm thinking there's a famous quote by Martin Luther King that says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. How does that quote and the concept of allyship tie into our opportunity to advance racial equity today? Don, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to say that I can't speak on behalf of the task force. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, myself as a member of the California Task Force on Reparations. But in answer to your question, um, how can I answer it any better than, I, I can't speak any better than the movie itself, uh, which depicts very clearly layer upon layer upon layer of injustice that cumulatively the overall impact has been our present day reality in America. Um, so I wanna thank John for this wonderful film. And I also um, uh, can't explain uh, that quote any better than the speakers themselves, Judith and Glenn and, and Mark and, and John as well. I can say that we can, as Asian Americans can look at this from a personal point of view, of, although there's no equivalence really for the unparalleled horror show of, of what black Americans have experienced over 400 years, uh, Asian Americans, we, we know something about discrimination. And John talked about his family being incarcerated as was mine during World War II because it happened to look like the enemy at the time. and. Uh, uh, some of the speakers, uh, Steve Phillips talked about housing discrimination. You know, uh, it was unlawful for Japanese Americans uh, who were immigrants to own property. So we had the same experience at my grandfather's level of, of using a white intermediary or straw purchaser to buy property in Japantown. And when my parents bought uh, their property in Oakland, a house, you know, the neighbors got together and demanded that they leave. So <clears throat> from a personal standpoint, that situation for us change. Why? Because of the Black American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I'm just pointing out one small example about how Asian Americans in particular have benefited uh, from the sacrifices and the struggles of, 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 of Black Americans. So that's part of the answer to the quote, you know, when you uh, have injustice anywhere, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's injustice everywhere. And to that extent, Asian Americans owe a huge debt uh, to uh, Black Americans uh, and the progress that's been made. Uh, however, nationally, this also should be viewed as, as Judith has said and Glenn and Mark as well, as an issue of democracy. I mean, we're living at a time where we're witnessing in real time when um, 
the voices of prejudice shout down the rule of law and the constitution. And when state lawmakers throughout the country, uh, their re response to a an election result they don't like is to make it harder to vote. Uh, and that's all cloaked in the same uh, problem. So um, yes, the, the reparations movement now shines a light on uh, things that America has had, has had willful amnesia about. And I will say that Asian American organizations, Sudo for Solidarity, Nikkei Resistors, the Japanese American Citizens League are really, have been working on this issue of supporting uh, HR 40, and this movement for quite some time. And Japanese Americans in particular, all of those who participated in the reparations effort for uh, Japanese Americans are really, they're eager, they're poised uh, to support this effort. Why? Because of the personal obligation, as I said, but also because uh, this is a way to make the country uh, stronger and better. And um, I think uh, by doing so, it makes it, um, uh, the more perfect union that John just talked about uh, become a reality. And without doing it, um, this ever widening racial wealth gap, this division in our society is simply going to continue. Nothing is to be gained by ignoring it. It's only going to get worse. So um, I want to thank the filmmaker, John, for doing this and thank the panelists for their insightful remarks. Well, thanks, Don. Well, I, uh, we also are a little over a year after the murder of George Floyd, and I always think of um, that video with uh, George Floyd's daughter where she famously said, my daddy's going to change the world. And I wanted to start with you, Mark. Um, if, um, do you think that has happened? Are we advancing racial equity now? And if so, or if not, how will we measure success? You know, her daddy woke up the world. The death of her daddy had, a, had an impact uh, that no single uh, tragic event has had in modern American history because it spurred people to act, uh, whether they acted via protest, whether they acted via social media, whether they acted via making commitments, uh, whether they acted via uh, all sorts of things. And, and you know, I have to share, I, I may have done this, some of you all may have heard me do this, but I have to share a, a personal reflection of what George Floyd uh, did uh, because it, uh, uh, I, got a, I got a letter in uh, July of last year uh, from someone that I'd gone to middle school with many, many years ago. And the middle school I attended, I integrated. I was one of the first two black students to attend that middle school. And as you can imagine, uh, you faced in the American South, this was in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, uh, racial bullying, name calling, uh, lots of things. And, and in my instance, uh, my, my most vivid recollections are uh, older white white boys uh, calling me and my other black classmate names in the hallway and on the playground, derogatory names, using the N word all the time. This letter came to me and it was, it was a letter of apology from uh, a white boy I hardly remember who said that the George Floyd moment and the death of George Floyd caused him to re-examine who he was and what was inside of him. And that uh, he felt like he wanted to apologize to me. And of course he made comments that, you know, you have been far more successful than I've been uh, as I followed your career, but I just wanted, and it, it was a letter, he signed it with no return address. So the point I'm making is as to whether when George Floyd's daughter said what she said, it had a profound impact on many, 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 many people. Will it, and has it spurred a continuous movement? Is it the third reconstruction as, as Glenn has suggested? Uh, what will be the long-term impact uh, of, uh, of the death of George Floyd, which came after 
Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and so many other tragic incidents uh, coming after President 45 uh, 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 in the last year, President 45 is, is still remains to me a very open question, but there's no doubt uh, that the, the world is more woke, but there's also a new backlash. It manifested itself in January 6th. It manifests itself every day with these, uh, these pernicious, uh, hateful, anti-democratic voting laws. They, it manifests itself with the attack on LGBT Q rights uh, by asserting these specious arguments about religious freedom. It, it manifests itself uh, uh, in many, many, many ways. Uh, the attack on the mere notion of teaching about racism and structural racism and institutional racism in schools. Uh, and so there is a growing friction, growing tension. Uh, and what's at stake is really the fight and the battle for the future of the country, whether the future is going to be a, a future of white supremacy and uh, single race domination in economics and education and public policy and voting and democracy, or whether the future is going to be a multicultural uh, democracy uh, based on some fundamental principles of freedom and justice and equity. Well, that's really what I think is at stake in the George Floyd moment is a catalyzing moment, no doubt, uh, but it's too early for me to say, too early for me to tell, too early for me. And I think for all of us, we have to be in the fight, on the field, in the battle, not simply be observers or spectators or commentators, uh, but to whatever lane you choose, whatever method you choose, whatever means you choose to be in this work and to be in this fight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, following up on that, uh, Glenn, in terms of the backlash, um, but yet the opportunity, and you talked about um, kind of trying to um, curtail different perspectives and voices. What, what are your thoughts about where we are today? Yeah, I mean, I think Mark hit it on the head. I mean, it is an inflection point. We have, we have, we have a pretty stark choice in front of us. Um, maybe that's the opportunity and the benefit. Um, uh, in this moment, um, the choice is one towards greater freedom, liberation, collective solidarity, or one that is really about living into the worst of who we are as people. For me, that just seems like a pretty stark choice in this moment. Um, I will say what I am in, that I see that I think is um, that brings hope is you know I think the Biden administration coming in. Um, and in day one, centering uh, 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 race and equity in an executive order. I think it creates real possibility. I think the changes we're looking for are both about hearts and minds, the narrative, but they're also fundamentally about like reimagining how our institutions work and represent people. You know, all of the panelists have named this, but I think we're in a moment where we really do have the opportunity to do that, to reimagine what governing means in this country. Um, the, you know, I think the, the last piece, just to your point um, earlier, Mary, about measurement, um, it's good to name these things, but what is it that we're actually talking about success looks like? And I think at the end of the day, it's got to be rooted in the material gains of everyday black and brown folk. I think we, you know, um, have to continue to demand that with our demands comes measure. Um, as folks make policy change, we have to demand process change. Are you measuring it? Are you reporting it? Are we actually able to see those tangible gains, material gains in people's lives? Um, and I think it's a big fight ahead of us. But I'm really, um, I, I guess, inspired by what I see happening on the ground. Um, that it seems to me every day, um, folks are pushing um, and winning on a new way for us to think about um, what equity means, um, how we actually get at that in the material way. So yeah, I, I know that the fight ahead of us is big, but I'm also um, inspired by what I see folks doing um, locally on a daily basis. 
Well, I, uh, another uh, kind of sad anniversary is we're coming up to a year since the death of John Lewis. And, um, you know, he fought so bravely to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and, and ended up getting knocked down. And, uh, but he spent his life standing up and not letting that stop him. And as he would say, uh, making good trouble. Um, Judith, I was gonna ask you about, uh, you know, how can we harness that energy and, and make progress and, and, and really, um, you know, realize John Lewis's vision? Uh, we have to continue making good trouble, that's for sure. Uh, and good trouble means lots of different things. Uh, it means, first of all, being in the streets. You know, we've seen a sleeping pain because people took to the streets um, last summer young people especially, young people of color, all different races, um, deciding that they had to stand against racism, they had to stand against police violence and state violence. And being in the streets has actually led to a lot of change. Uh, and so that is what we have to continue to do. But we also, um, you know, this is an advancement project we talked about, you have to organize, protest, and vote and then rinse and repeat, right? Because uh, you got to keep doing it. You can't get in the streets, then go vote, and then walk away and leave it to our elected officials to handle the business. We have to hold them accountable. And so, you know, as we're looking at what's happening in the states, because one of the things that we have to understand, is, especially on the voting issues, that it's not just that they're making voting harder, but there's a more nefarious thing, which is a power grab that is happening where they are taking away the power of local elected officials. And so that means that we have to turn to Congress. And so we have to, again, be in the streets. Those of us who litigate, we are gonna be in the court. Those of us who have, um, who can pick up a phone or write a letter to our member of Congress or Senate have to do that also. We have to turn out and we just have to keep doing it. This is this is the work. This is freedom work. Um, we can't sit home and be complicit, but we have to continue to push. Well, thanks, Judith. Well, I'm going to turn to John. Uh, you named your film Reparations. What do you want us to think about in terms of reparations? Well, I think what I talked about earlier is um, I think that there's a very uh, narrow view from far too many people that this is just about uh, payments, um, but it's really about, to me, and what I learned through this project is it's really about healing, right? And it's really addressing the racial wealth gap that has been condoned for far too long in this country and that it's time to take a critical look at that, that this is, um, and I think Shakira Simley in the film said it very eloquently, this is not just about personal choices, right? There are systemic barriers in place which are enabling this racial wealth gap. And it is time for this country to look at that um, and think about strategies to begin to address that because it is so glaring right now um, that it is time to figure out how we move forward as a country um, in a way that we can promote equity for everybody because, and I truly believe this, that is going to make this country better for everyone, not just those who benefit in the short term, but for everybody in this country to have a more harmonious uh, society where people are working together. And maybe that's pie in the sky for many people, but I believe in that. Um, I believe that is possible. Um, it is going to take constant work. I think Judy, Judith said it very well. This is not a one and done type of deal. This is, this is a, a lifetime commitment of effort um, to make progress because um, sometimes progress is very slow and painful in this country as we all know, um, but it takes all of us working together to make it. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful that we can see in the years ahead and I'm hopeful that um, those who are participating with us today can find their own way to make a difference in this fight. Um, you know, mine happens to be making films, but everybody has their own gifts and talents that can contribute towards this movement. And I hope that everybody will find their own way. 
Thanks, John. I'm going to turn to you, Don, and just ask uh, kind of what questions should we be asking when we're having a dialogue about reparations and what, um, you know, what kind of discussion should we have? Well, I want to reiterate with John what John just said. I think we are at a moment. I think, you know, people are talking about an inflection point, but I think we really are. And I think Glenn sort of summarized it. Well, we're seeing things that we have not seen. It, it's really unprecedented. Even during the civil rights movement, there were not people turning out as, as they are. So in that regard, we can't be bystanders to history. We, we just simply cannot be. And so we have to find a way to be active. Professor um, Eric Yamamoto in the film talked about uh, the self-interest of our political leaders. And I think his point to me is very well taken. That is when um, the, the two align, the, the self-interest of our congressional leaders align with what the people are saying, that's when real change happens. So uh, yes, we need to demonstrate as uh, was done during the Floyd, um, after the Floyd murder, but it has to translate into public action and in particular voting. So that, that's going to be key. And remember for the Japanese American redress and reparations effort, uh, it, it started with relatively small numbers of people and then it turned into a groundswell. It took years, 18 years, but uh, it happened. It was viewed as impossible uh, then but, uh, and daunting, but it happened. And I, I'm similarly uh, hopeful. And <clears throat> I just wanna say one word about uh, reparations that a couple of things that John mentioned how important acknowledgement is. Um, the fierce urgency of now is this huge and ever widening uh, racial wealth gap. And that needs to be addressed. I, I think the Houghton Street understood that this was not just about Derek Chauvin and police brutality, although that is definitely front and center. That was a result of just centuries of layer upon layer accumulation of injustice that results in this kind of horrific outcome. And uh, I think that realization is key to moving on uh, to the next step, which is social change. And in this regard, we all have a responsibility. This is where citizenship comes out, the role of ordinary people in a democracy. And uh, I think it's been said by the other speakers, we are at a a moment when democracy is surely uh, being challenged. So in the last four years, the rise of demagoguery, meaning appeals to prejudice, uh, fear monger and scapegoat, and trafficking and conspiracy theories and alternative facts, that that's, you know, has become widespread to a degree we've never seen, where literally millions uh, don't believe that the elections are valid. So um, that that is the uh, opportunity that that's the difficulty we're in, but that also poses the opportunity for the rest of us to get involved. Well, thanks, Don. Well, we're coming to the end of this panel. I wish we had a lot more time because we've just had superb panelists and there's so much to discuss, but uh, let's just do a, a lightning round. We have about four minutes, so everybody 30 seconds. I know it's not enough time, but uh, I'll follow up on Don's point, the fierce urgency of now. So I just want everybody kind of final 30 second thought. Why should we be hopeful now? And for all those listening today, how can they help? So I'll start with you, Judith. We should be hopeful because um, our people are hopeful. Um, you know, as much as we have been through hell, um, all of us know that there is something better and that we are dreaming and working towards that something better. And to get involved, um, first of all, you should go to advancementproject.org, but you should also make sure you pick up the phone and call your senators about the For the People Act and the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Thank you. How about you, Glenn? love this question. Hope is, um, in my mind, is simply the combination of power and love in action. And I think in this moment, what's so critical is that acknowledge your power, get real about what you're going to do with so all the panelists have named, and center yourself in the love and that joy that um, in so many ways Judith was named. 
Don? Well, um, the leadership of Black folks in America leads the way for the entire country. And for all that um, that community has gone through to continue to have faith and love in this country is quite unbelievable and inspiring. And I think it, it, it shines a light toward uh, the future. So I'm hoping that this movement for reparations continues to gain strength. I think it will. And there's a place for all of us to support it. John? Well, I think I'm just really hopeful in this moment because I've been so um, inspired by the amount of courage that I've seen spreading across this country and an understanding and awakening to the fact that together we can accomplish anything. That is so true. And, and Mark, I will give you the last word. Yeah, uh, we have to have hope because without hope we have nothing. We have to have hope because hope is the energy uh, and the optimism. And when I get down, I think about my ancestors going through the door of no return at Goree Island. I think about Harriet Tubman traversing the back forest of east, the eastern shore of Maryland with serpents and gators and hunters uh, trying to find her. I think about Frederick Douglass, who after he was whipped so severely, he ran away from slavery. I think about uh, the people whose journey was far more difficult than ours. I think about, our, in my case, my parents and grandparents who sat behind the screens on buses, went to segregated schools, did not have the right to vote. Uh, and then he emerged after the civil rights era to do things that were unimaginable. We have to have hope. Without hope, we have nothing. We have to be optimistic. Those of us who have the special opportunity to play leadership roles have to have the strength of our internal constitutions and the strength of our internal spirituality, morality, uh, mental uh, agility uh, to lead and fight and work alongside of allies to make to bring about this change. Without hope, we have nothing. Thank you so much. Well, what an incredible panel. Um, I know some of the themes we've talked about. I love Mark ended with without hope, we have nothing. And I know Don mentioned the fierce urgency of now. So I know I'm feeling inspired. I hope everyone who's listening feels inspired. First, I wanna thank John so much for his wonderful film and sharing it with us today. And thanks so much to all our amazing panelists and their organizations who are doing such important work every day. Um, thank you everyone who joined us. I know I'm energized and thank you so much again. Thank you.